This is going to be our lecture on chapter 5. We're going to go into the Middle Ages and see what's going on with the Germanic people now. This time period that we're going to look at is approximately 500 CE to 1100 CE. And we're going to see the foundations of Europe forming. So let's get into it. So the title of the chapter is Synthesis, Rise of the West. And the synthesis that they're talking about are three distinctive cultures forming from 5 to 1100. The cultures include the classical from the Greeks and the Romans, the Christian, and then also the Germanic people. So we studied the classical in chapter 2 and 3, and we studied the forming of religions, the Abrahamic religions, including Christianity, in chapter 4. So these three distinctive cultures come together to fuel the rise of the northern western Europe, this area here. And we are finding in early medieval culture unique political, religious, and linguistic traditions that still survive today. We are going to go over the empire created by the German chieftain Charlemagne, Charles the Great. And he gives us an excellent example of this synthesis. His empire, known as the Carolingian Empire, is fueled by feudalism, a political and military system that establishes patterns of social rank and status that dominate early medieval society. Uh, artworks that include fabulous books, amongst other things. The Bayou Tapestry is also something that we'll see. And the Germanic people, the Germanic tribes, were the tribal folks that followed a migratory existence, probably more than likely originating around where uh, Ukraine is today, and then spreading out from there. So these people all have different names like Visigoths, Franks, Vandals, uh, Ozturgoths, uh, the Angles and the Saxons, Burgundians. And they are migratory and they are also farmers and they are especially raiders too. And there's a, a, a history of raiders um, in this part of the world. The Goths are being driven west by the Huns, and we see this also in uh, other places. Like I said, where we, the, the way to survive is to raid, and Rome was a really good place for that in Rome's territories because they had a lot of wealth. So we have no urban settlements, monumental architecture, and no cohesive writing that we could identify. The Romans were not sure what to do with the Germans, and they allowed them to settle on the borders of the empire in exchange for protecting the empire. But antagonism between Rome and the Visigoths leads to a military showdown, and the Battle of Adrianople, about 130 miles northwest of Constantinople, in 378 <clears throat> CE, the Visigoths defeat the invincible, what appears to be invincible Roman army, and they kill the East Roman Emperor Valens and disperse the army. Almost immediately thereafter, the Visigoths swept across the Roman border and start raiding cities, and the decline of the West, including Rome itself, kind of begins in 410. Their culture is one of farming nomads, fighting life. They are good with a bow and arrow. They have spurs and stirrups to ride their horses. Uh, stirrups, which you use to steer a horse with your feet, are invented by the Chinese Mongols. Again, another raiding community, kind of nomadic community as well. So again, on the plains here in uh, central northern Asia, this is kind of a way of life. So we're talking about pretty fierce people. 
they are living a warrior life that is bound by fealty, a loyalty between a Germanic warrior and his chieftains. And the practice of rewarding the warriors would become a fundamental practice in feudalism. Germanic law is not legislated by any state as the Roman tradition. It is a collection of customs passed orally and is known as common law. So instead of, say, Hammurabi, uh, penalties for crimes varied among social standings for the guilty party. Amongst the Germans, a person's guilt or innocent might be determined by ordeal involving fire or water. Such trials reflect the faith of the Germanic people uh, to have their fate placed on the wills of the, the, the deities of nature. Some Germanic literature. I think the three major works in this era are Beowulf in 700 CE, the Song of Nibelung, and also the Song of Roland. We're going to get deeper into Beowulf and Roland a little bit later. So Beowulf originates among the Anglo-Saxons, recorded in Old English, the Germanic language spoken in part of the British Isles between the 5th and 11th century. The Song of Nibelung is a product of the Burgundy tribes recorded in Old German. And then the Frank, Frankish Song of Song of Roland is in Old French. And these are stories that are celebrating the deeds of warrior heroes. And this is kind of common in literature. Kings and warrior heroes uh, learning about life by being fierce. And I think we have that in common with the Iliad uh, for sure. And uh, probably the Maharabhata uh, as well. The Maharabhata as well. The 3,000 line epic poem known as Beowulf is the first monumental literary compo composition in European vernacular language, everyday language. It is about a Scandinavian prince and this Scandinavian prince is going to kill a monster, then the monster's mom, which he beheads and he's holding right now. And then when he becomes a king, he, behead, he kills a dragon, but the dragon will ultimately kill him. Composed by the Anglo-Saxons in the 8th century, it's not written down until the 10th century or, or 900 CE. In the um, it's unrhymed and embellished with two term metaphors known as kettings, whale path for sea, for example, ring giver for king. In Germanic art in Anglo Saxon, so these are the Anglo Saxons who would have told this story here. So the Anglo-Saxons are in the British Isles. Uh, their history is from around 450 to 1066. And in 1066, you will have the Norman invasion uh, coming from the Scandinavians. And that will create a new culture in Great Britain. So with the Anglo-Saxons, they are... Uh, uh, re-establishing uh, Christianity. Uh, we're creating charters and law. Charters are where you buy land from wealthy lords, feudal lords, and then use that land to form a town. And the town has a charter, which is kind of its series of laws and how it's going to operate. You can see the Anglo-Saxon culture in terms of the material culture of their buildings, their dressing style, their illuminated texts, and their grave goods, and we will see a little bit of that as well. The wealth of monasteries and the success of Anglo-Saxon society attracted the attention of people from continental Europe and the Danes and the Norwegians. Following the conquest, the Anglo-Saxon nobility were either exiled or joined the ranks of the peasantries peasantry. 
So the Normans and the uh, northern Scandinavians are often referred to as the Vikings. And I think we, we, we think of them as the Vikings if they're in their ships and they are busy raiding stuff. So some of their ships have been fairly well preserved. There are some major burials, one at Sutton Hoo. I want to show you some art from that. The ship is functioning as a centerpiece of Scandinavian culture. Uh, this uh, ship here is from a burial mound from 834 AD or CE, but parts of the ship come from a little bit older. So the bow and the stern are elaborately decorated with wood carvings, then the characteristic gripping beast style, also known as the Asseberg style. So from one of these ships, we find a burial. And the burial is at Sutton Hoo. Sutton Hoo is in eastern England and was a 7th century Anglo-Saxon grave that contained weapons, coins, utensils, jewelry, and a small lyre, a type of guitar that we will be looking at today in its kind of maturish form. The landmark treasures were packed along with a corpse of a chieftain in an 89-foot-long ship. One of the most remarkable things, now that the helmet's cool, but the buckle, the, the purse buckle. So the purse buckle, we find it richly, densely patterned with interlaced snakes, beast, uh, beaked bird-like heads, and this kind of barbarian art is evidenced in Sutton Hoo and Elser. Remember, that's what the Romans called the, the Germanics. It shows technical sophistication, artistic originality, and also it shows a kind of abstract mathematical quality different from what we studied in the mosque, but there's some also overlapping qualities as well. Obviously, the Germanics are not the um, sophisticated mathematicians that uh, the Arab Muslims are in this time period. So Celtic and Anglo-Saxon styles, this is a Celtic page here. They are non-Germanic Iron Age folk who had migrated through Europe between the 5th and the 3rd century CE, settling in the British Isles uh, before the time of Jesus. A great flowering of Celtic art and literature occurs with the conversion of the Celts to Christianity in the 5th century CE. This is done by Patrick, a British monk who was said to baptize more than 120,000 people and founded 300 churches in Ireland. Christian manuscripts have a decorative style closely related to the linear ornamentation that we find at Sutton Hoo, which we just looked at. So here we are looking at a page, uh, the Book of Kells, uh, the Lindisfarne Gospels, and we have Bibles that are painstakingly copied in local letters. It'll be Carolingian at one time, Gothic letters at another time, Celtic letters obviously in the early formation, and you'll have these copies of the Bible in the New Testament, and then you have these introductory pages called carpet pages, and they are densely, densely ornamented. And in my opinion, some of the finest art ever made. You know, what's interesting about book art is that once you get to the printing press in 1455, the handmade book that might take years or decades to finish disappears completely. The amount of money that you can make from producing one book is not important when that book can be mass produced. So the art of this era is really killed off by technology. And again here, we're seeing this head, the interlacing of the letters, geometry, fantastic characters, really, 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 really cool stuff. And if you're interested in this, and you're watching this in Southern California, at the uh, Huntington Library in Pasadena, 
they have a really good collection of illuminated manuscripts. They're called illuminated manuscripts, these illustrated books. And they also have the very first printed book by Johann Gutenberg in 1455, which I think there are very few, just a handful of those books left. Charlemagne. So Charlemagne is a Frankish or French warlord, uh, Charles the Great, known as Charlemagne. He has this dream of restoring the Roman Empire under a Christian leadership, and a, he's a, a really good warrior and an administrator as well. His holy years, the Christian equivalent of the Muslim Jihad, resulted in the forcible conversion of the Saxons, the Lombards in northern Italy, the Slavic people along the Danube, and his campaigns also pushed the Muslims back beyond, beyond the Pyrenees into Spain, a series of mountains. In 800, Pope Leo III crowned Charlemagne the Emperor of the Romans, and this begins the Holy Roman Empire. In the Holy Roman Empire, Charlemagne sought control of conquered lands by placing them in the hands of local administrators. He bestows titles like counts and duke to them. He's reviving trade with the East. He's stabilizing the currency of the realm. And he's also pursuing diplomatic ties with Baghdad, with one of the uh, caliphs there. And in fact, the caliph will grant Charlemagne's court a gift of an elephant. In the Carolingian Renaissance, his Charlemagne's mission was driven by a passionate interest in education and the arts. Like most Germanic war chieftains, he could barely read or write, but he was good with a sword. So he sponsors a renaissance or a rebirth of learning and literacy. This is before the uh, Italian and Northern Renaissance, about 600 years before that's going to happen. The most notable person in his rebirth is Alcuin of York. Alcuin of York is an Anglo-Saxon monk, and he works as a teacher and a translator, and his revival of learning includes establishing schools of writing. In the schools, we get the, uh, uh, the writing where we break into capital letters to start sentences, standardized punctuation, breaking pages into paragraphs, and maybe most importantly, a style of letters known as the minuscule. And the minuscules are the prototype for the lowercase letters we use today. The Romans, who invent the uppercase letters that we use today, did not make lowercase letters. So now we have uppercase and lowercase letters coming out of this. The Renaissance is best reflected in the fact that about 80% of the oldest classical Latin manuscripts survive in Carolingian copies. The Rule of St. Benedict is a book written by St. Benedict. We studied him in the last semester. He starts monasteries. So this is a book for how to live communally under the authority of an abbot, the head of the monastery. His rule is summed up in the motto of the Benedictine uh, Confederation, peace and, and the traditional pray and work. Peace, pray, and work. So they are setting up needs for the monks, establishing order, understanding the relationship between the nature of human beings. They are all obviously celibate. And they are also figuring out how do, we, how do we live as full-time monks and not have to make a living? And one of the ways that they do that is by bookmaking. They are self-sufficient with their own farms. They brew their own beer, their own wine. And they have found a way to have their own kind of city of God. St. Benedict, Benedict's model for the monochastic life was the family, with the abbot as the father, all the monks as brothers, and 
all the rule is acceptable to the communities of women under the authority of an abbess. We get reforms that are happening also from William I, the Duke of, uh, of Aquitaine, between 875 and 918. During its height from 950 to 1130, the Cluniac movement was one of the largest religious forces in Europe. And what we're getting is larger monasteries being built. So in these giant monasteries, and here's an example one here, Sangal is a Roman Catholic uh, Carolingian era monastery that became an independent principality between the 9th and the 13th centuries. It is one of the chief Benedictine abbeys in Europe. And it had one of the richest libraries, a refectory, refectory a dining hall. Um, it had a cloister, the covered a walkway that opened up into a courtyard and a garden that they can grow plants and herbs. They had aisles and transepts in the church that were built to house the relics of saints and martyrs. And this collecting the bones of saints and martyrs is going to be very important in the cathedrals that are going to be built in the high Middle Ages, which are going to be part of the pilgrimage route, which is going to be the very important part of tourism and a very important part of a Catholic's life to travel to all the churches and to find the healing powers of these relics and reliquies. Feudalism. So when Charlemagne died in 1814, that short-lived unity that he brought to Western Europe kind of died with him. He had turned the Frankish kingdom into an empire, but failed to establish any legal and administrative machinery comparable with that with the imperial Rome that we studied. There was no standing army, no system of taxation, no single code of law to unify this widely diverse population. The Carolingian Empire is shattered by the Scandinavian Vikings, and Charlemagne's sons and grandsons could not repel these raids of the fierce invaders who are ravaging the northern coasts of the empire. That ultimately seems to end around 1000 CE when the, well, when you have the Norman invasion of Great Britain, and then also uh, possibly the Vikings become Christianized, and they may also be integrating into the European mainland and probably find that it's a lot easier to survive uh, farming and trading and as a merchant than as a raider. To the south of Charlemagne, Muslims are invading and taking land, and Charlemagne's three grandsons divide the empire amongst themselves. The French-speaking from the German-speaking are separated and we get a fragmentation of the empire. So the grandsons are also uh, kind of solidifying feudalism from the Roman and Germanic tradition. Warriors are splitting the spoils of war. And in feudalism and the feudal contract, we are getting, there's no money being printed that is widely accepted as currency so feudalism involves the exchange of land for military service. In return for the grant of land, known as a fief or feudalism, a vassal owed his lord a certain amount of fighting days, usually 40 per year. The contract between lord and vassal also involved a number of other obligations, including the lord's provision of the court of justice, the vassal's contribution of the ransom if his lord were captured, and the reciprocation of hospitality between the two. In an age of instability, feudalism provided a rudimentary form of local government while answering the need for security against armed attack. Those engaged in the feudal contract constituted roughly the upper 10% of European society. 
A male member of the nobility was first and foremost a mounted man of arms, a chevalier from the German word cheval for horse, a knight from the Germanic nick, a youthful servant, a soldier, equipped with stirrups, protected by chain mail, flexible armor made by interlaking uh, metal rings, and armed with weapons like a broadsword and a shield. The, knight, the knight's conduct and manners in all aspects of life are driven by a strict code of behavior called chivalry. Chivalry demanded that the knight be courageous in battle, loyal to his lord and fellow warriors, and reverent towards women. Feudal life was marked by ceremonies and symbols almost as extensive as those in the Christian church. For instance, a vassal received his fief with an elaborate procedure known as investiture, in which oaths and fealty were formally exchanged. Medieval warfare was both a profession and a pastime, as knights entertained themselves with jousts and personal, which is personal combat between men on horseback with long poles, and war games that imitated the trials of combat. Now, what about the other 90 percent of people? The other 90 percent are serfs. So the serfs are unfree peasants. And along with freemen who farm the soil, they live quite differently from their landlords bound to large farms or manors. Like the, uh, they are provided with food in exchange for military protection and furnished by the nobility. They own no property and were forbidden to leave the manor. On the positive side of this, though, they also could not be evicted. So again, the feudal lord owed the serfs, owed his people. And although there wasn't a lot of upward mobility, at least you were safe from the instability and from the raids. So during the Middle Ages, these reciprocal obligations, a system known as mannerism, became firmly fixed until around the 11th century. It's beneficial to both classes at this time period. And by comparison with the Greeks and the Romans, who were dependent on uh, the ready availability of the slave market, the labor save the inventions and labor-saving devices that were invented in this era, like the heavy-wheeled plow, the spinning wheel, the lathe, um, the construction of windmills and water mills, um, mean that a lot of the back-breaking labor is now done by machines. The Norman Conquest. So as early as the 700 AD or CE, the seafarers known as the Vikings or the Norsemen or the Northmen or the Normans had moved beyond the bounds of their Scandinavian homelands and constructed long ships equipped with sailing gear that allowed them to tack into the wind. Expert shipbuilders, sailors, and navigators, they colonized Iceland, they set up a colony in Greenland before the year 1000, and they sailed the North Sea and established trading centers in Kiev, amongst other places, and they were known amongst the Arab traders as the Rus. They gave their name, in fact, the Rus gave is the name that we give Russia. They traded in animal hides and amber, and they also in, include trading Eastern Europeans or Slavs, which is where the word slave is derived from. They began their raids in England in 793 and continued till the end of the 9th century. In 1066, under the leadership of William of Normandy, 5,000 men crossed the English Channel, and at the Battle of Hastings, William defeats the Anglo-Saxons King Harold and seized the throne of England. The transfer of power goes from the Anglo-Saxons to the Norman noblemen, who were already vassals of the King of France, and they brought feudalism to England. To raise money, William had a detailed census of all the property in the realm that is recorded in the Doomsday Book, which laid the basis for the collection of uh, taxes. We are also looking here at the Bayou Tapestry, the Bayou Tapestry 
is one of the most valuable artworks of the 11th century. In the Bayou Tapestry, we are seeing the battle of uh, that William of Normandy to control England, woven with eight colors of wool yarn, 622 figures, 190 horses, and 500 real and other fantastic animals make up a richly detailed narrative that unrolls in the manner of an earlier victory landmark from the Romans, the Column of Trajan. So the portion of the textile that is often talked about is crossing the English Channel with some 500 to 700, for 5,000 to 7,000 vassals that made up the fighting force. It is likely that probably women probably are the ones who did the embroidery on this, although women are only depicted in it four times. The castle. So the castle, uh, influenced by the Normans and spread around, this one, Crec de Chevrolet, is a crusader castle in Syria based on the Norman castle. In the Norman castle, we have the construction of stone castles and churches atop hills and other vulnerable sites. The castle features a keep, a square tower that has a dungeon, a main hall, and a chapel, and then also has turrets with tooth-shaped uh, battlements in it and generally surrounded by a moat, a trench filled with water to deter enemy invasion. The Crusades. So in the year 1000, there are numerous circumstances that contribute to a change in the character of medieval life. The Normans push the Muslims out of the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, they push them out of Spain. And at the same time, there is rising agricultural productivity, surplus encouraging trade and travel, and the Crusades in the 11th and 13th century were directly related to these changes. They cause an economic revitalization, um, but they also cause decades of war between Muslims and Christians. They began as an effort to rescue Jerusalem from Muslim Turks, who were threatening the Byzantine Empire, that would be the Greek Orthodox Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, and also denying Christian pilgrimages and access to the Holy Land, like Jerusalem. So the First Crusade is called by Pope Urban II in 1095, and they are there to recover land and um, not to convert pagans. So thousands of people, laymen and clergy, took up the cross and they marched. Once the Crusades began, uh, the looting outweighed any spiritual activity. And what we begin to see here also is in the system of feudalism, the oldest male inherits all the land, inherits everything. Well, what do you do with the second or third son? Well, you send them on these crusades, and on these crusades, they are going to loot and they are going to find riches. But also what happens that we'll be studying in our next lecture is they begin to find people to trade with and trade routes, and they also will come back with their riches, they will buy land, and they will set up charters, and the beginning of European cities are going to be the result of um, ultimately, the you could say from the Crusades, but also a way of dealing with the limitations of the laws of inheritance that come inherently in feudalism. Now, the Crusades... Uh, are not very successful. There are four of them. They really are just an essay in looting. And by 1291, all the lands that were re recaptured, including Jerusalem, are lost again to uh, Muslims. And in 200 years of fighting, they did not really secure anything. Constantinople will finally fall in 1453 to the Ottoman Turks. And when Constantinople falls, now the trade route between Europe and the Middle East is all over, 
And that is going to begin the age of exploration and looking for other routes to India and China other than land routes, which will lead us around the uh, Cape Horn in Africa and ultimately lead to the discovery of the Western Hemisphere by the Europeans. So once these lands have been recaptured in Spain in particular, this is when we begin to find the pilgrimage routes. So the pilgrimage is based on generally rural areas or small towns where they're building giant cathedrals. And these giant cathedrals, many of them still standing today, have big barrel vaults, not many windows because we don't have the Gothic engineering that we will see in the next chapter. And this pilgrimage goes from Spain all the way into France and in a way is making sure that the Spanish territory remains Catholic, remains Christian after being Moorish and Muslim for a couple hundred years when we studied the Alhambra. In these pilgrimages, they are trying to get healing and good luck, I guess, from praying to the venerated bones of saints that are often held in reliquaries. This is the pilgrimage at San Fa, which is an abbey church in Conk. And it's for pilgrims on their stop to their way from Santiago de Compostela, which is now Spain, the end of the pilgrimage journey. And here we have the remains of a little girl named, uh, a martyred little girl named San Fa. Now, back to literature, now that we kind of know a little bit about the Crusades and things. So the Song of Roland are the ideas of the fighting nobility or contain those ideas. It is the oldest and greatest French epic poem. It was made in the early 7th, uh, 12th century and is based on an event that happened in 778 CE. So much like the Iliad, it is a legendary battle that happened hundreds of years earlier. So looking at it as strictly a historical document, probably not a good idea. It's about the ambush of the gates of Spain, a narrow pass in the Pyrenees of Charlemagne's rear guard, led by Charlemagne's nephew, Roland. They return from an expedition against the Muslims, and this 4,000-line Song of Heroic Deeds is transmitted orally for more than three centuries before it's ultimately written down. So generation after generation of jongleurs, professional entertainers, are wandering from court to court, chanting the story, and court I mean the court of the king, not legal courts, and chanting the story, maybe embellishing it with episodes of, of folklore and accompanying it with a stringed instrument called the lyre, which we are going to see here in a couple minutes. Although the music in the poem does not survive, it is likely consisted of a single, highly improvised line of melody, and the tune was probably syllabic, setting one note to each syllable. And like the folk song, dependent on uh, simple repetition. So again, similar to the Epic of Gilgamesh and the Iliad, the Song of Roland is grandiose, and it is prizing the performance of heroic deeds. So the story about Roland, he has a willingness to die for his religious belief. Um, he is uh, um, bringing up the rear of a expedition, and ultimately he is going to have too much pride to call for help when he's attacked, and everybody is going to be slaughtered. He does, at the end, manage to blow this horn. And when he blows the horn, Charlemagne's troops are going to come and avenge them. So it is a story, again, of misplaced pride, of uh, fighting and beliefs, and then also of revenge. Uh, kind of similar to Achilles killing Hector in the Iliad. So music. 
early medieval music. So the major developments that are happening um, are kind of the solemn sound of the um, of the medieval runk monk that is writing in the margin of the songbook, a, a plain song that probably is uh, at a Gregorian kind of classic Gregorian chants and adding antiphones or verses sung as responses to religious text. They are establishing plain song with trope, the addition of music or words, and establishing a liturgical chant. So a special kind of trope called sequence is adding words to long passages and um, occurring at the end parts of the Mass. We are also seeing the beginning of liturgical drama in the church. So if you think about it, the church is responsible for music, for plays, again, about the religion. When we look at the clothes, the clothes are very modest, again, all influenced by the church. So what you can say here is that the church really has a monopoly, for the most part, on culture. I want to show you what a Gregorian chant looks like. It is a form of monophonic, unaccompanied sacred song in the Western Catholic Church. And it is probably a synthesis of Roman chant and Gaelic chant. They're organized initially four, then eight, and 12 modes. The chants can be sung by using six note patterns called hexachords. And let's just see kind of what that sounds like for a couple seconds. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And leads me beside still waters. He revives. Okay, so you notice that all of their voices are rising and falling together. Ultimately, when we get into the next chapter, we're going to see the plain chant turning into polyphony. And here's just a couple of seconds of what polyphony sounds like. Polyphony literally means many sounds. And if you want to think of the best example of polyphony in nature, just imagine the dawn chorus in springtime. That wonderful sound of birds' voices, all mixing and crossing and matching, and yet making a really beautiful music. I think that's a great way to describe polyphony. That's, that's, really, that's really a wonderful analogy there. The last couple things that we're going to get into. So this is an age of the poetry of troubadours and also of courtly love. Eleanor of Aquitaine is considered to be one of the early patrons of this. So courtly love are stories and songs about the flirting going on in these, uh, in the, the churches, or in the, the, the castles of the feudal lords and the knights. They are kind of naughty. Um, so flirting is not something necessarily where you consummate the love with lovemaking. It is more about showing the respect of the beauty of the queen by flirting back and forth. And so you don't actually consummate it. So kind of courtly love and romantic love is kind of a way that you better yourself by being chivalrous, by being polite and by flirting, but you don't do anything. You have restraint. And that, of course, is still you know, a pretty uh, um, a big idea, I think, on romantic literature and things like that today. Troubadours. So during the Middle Ages, we get in the 11th century, which would be 1000 AD, Literacy is spreading, spreading beyond the Catholic schools and the monasteries, 
and the popularity of such forms as vernacular literature and lyric poetry are giving rise to the troubadours. Um, the troubadours are devoted to courtly love, chivalry, religion, and politics. In the German-speaking courts, we get a, a type of troubadour who have master guilds of poets and musicians and are flourishing later in German towns. So unlike the minstrels of old, troubadours are usually men and women of noble birth, and their poems were monophonic and syllabic, and they are being more expressive in their content, not necessarily in their musical style. And they are indebted to Arabic poetic forms. Often troubadours are reciting poems and then playing on a lute, uh, which would be a type of a horn or a lyre. The lyre is a pear-shaped wooden stringed instrument. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the lute is also a stringed instrument as well. The lyre and the lute are stringed instruments, my fault. It is a pear-stringed wooden instrument that is uh, Arabic, which means wood, and is invented by the Arabs in the end of the 6th century CE, and it was used to accompany vocal performances. Probably it gets to Europe from Muslim Spain. I want to take a look at what a lute looks like, and we are seeing a lute here. And just so you can kind of get an idea of what it sounds like and what it looks like. So a, uh, a lute is a, um, this is a Baroque lute, so it's a little bit later. It's, um, it's a multi-stringed instrument. Often uh, eight, 16 strings are kind of put together, but this is the kind of sound that it produces. And remember, this is a little more advanced than where we are. This would be about 600 years from where we're talking about now. And so troubadoric music, again sung in the courts, would have uh, a lot of songs about love. And I'll just make a couple more statements on romantic and courtly love in the next slide. <laughs> So here we're looking at a lute uh, with nine strings. This is what the medieval lute looks like, uh, but the, the, the Baroque lute was a video that I found just to give you an idea of how it operates. So we're writing love poetry, and we are getting into songs, again, the kind of flirting songs of courtly love. Women are also writing uh, uh Beatriz de Dia is writing songs about a lament for a lost lover. Here's a couple of lines. She uh, writes that she, uh, a song that I've been in great anguish is the title. It's about a lost knight love of hers because she didn't yield her love to him. And that if she could do anything, she would go back and do it again. She says in the poem, To him I'd give my heart, my love, my mind, my eyes, my life. Beautiful, gracious, sweet friend, when shall I hold you in my power? If I could lie with you for one night and give you a kiss of love, you can be sure I would desire greatly. So Lancelot by Christian Detroit. So Lancelot is part of the stories of a Welsh chieftain, uh, Welsh being from the British Isles, named Arthur. Um, the poem stands out uh, in terms of bloody combat, supernatural events, romantic alliances, 
and medieval romances, introducing the new and complex picture of human conduct and courtship in the court of courtly love. So in the courtly love tradition, women are objects of desire and objects of reward for performance of brave deeds. And also a courtly love is elevating a woman and her prototype, the Virgin Mary, as worthy of adoration and defining her exclusively in terms of the interests of men. That's obviously the very uh, patriarchal part of this. In the medieval romance, they are flattering and exalting the aristocratic lady, the object of their desired, and that the audience of these songs and these stories, primarily women, like soap operas and romantic harlequin novels today, where again, we see the same types of activities, men trying to impress women to achieve love. Ultimately, in the story of Lancelot, Lancelot, who has an affair with uh, King Arthur's bride, uh, will have to die. Okay, so that's it for the chapter. For our discussion, if this class is in the summer, this is an optional discussion. If this class is the spring or fall, it is mandatory. So I have a lecture on classical China and Japan in the Middle Ages. I have another supplemental lecture titled An Art for the Sacred World, Hinduism and Art from Buddhism, and also kind of things that relate to the formation of Buddhism. <clears throat> and then an assignment that is a really, really good video. Now, the video quality is not good, but the information in it is fantastic. And it shows you how in China, Buddhism, Taoism, which was in our first chapter, the way or the path, uh, aligning yourself with nature, health for your body, is aligned with Buddhism, which is psychology, health for the mind, and then also Confucianism. And Confucianism is a series of wisdoms and how to uh, run a government bureaucracy. And Confucianism is explaining how to behave as a society. Health for the mind, health for the body, how to behave in society. So three theologies and philosophies that instead of what we just studied, where Christian doctrine is explaining how to think, how to feel, um, how to dress, how to make music, um, how to be a society. This is done in a very different way, but accomplishing similar things, right? So I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. I hope you'll read the lecture. Uh, many of the links are very good. So when we, we had looked at the Shang Dynasty in chapter 1, and we get to the beginning of what we think of modern China in a dynasty from 221 to 206 BC that lays new laws and practices that end feudalism in China, replacing it with a centralized bureaucratic government. So think about that. A thousand years later, Europe is feudal. A thousand years before that, China has a centralized bureaucratic government. So both the military and the government is thriving. And what is interesting in China is a meritocracy, where rather than you being the rich, powerful landowner or more than likely son of a rich and powerful person, and you're the nepotism of that, or nepotism is happening through that maybe is more proper. Instead, they are scouring the countryside for the brightest minds, and there are tests and when you do well on these tests, you can join the bureaucracy and the government and make your way into the upper class. So the Qin Dynasty is creating an imperial state, unifying the, uh, the north and the south. The government sought to, thought to minimize the role of aristocrats and landowners and have direct administrative control over the peasantry. 
They also are putting into the, uh, into the practice the teachings of the Han Feizi, uh, by Han Fei. And we'll get into that in a second as well. You are looking at one of the terracotta warriors, in my opinion, one of the greatest collections of ceramic sculptures ever made. And I'll show you a picture of that here. So these are the terracotta warriors of Qi Xing Hong. Qi Xing Hong is the king of the Qing dynasty. He is conquering the Warring States, uniting China in 221 BC. He takes on the title emperor, Hong Di, and he would um, continue, and this idea of the emperor is going to continue for the next 2,000 years under many different dynasties that are changing about every two, three hundred years, and that is explained in the Mandate of Heaven that I showed you, I think, in the first chapter. So he is enacting political reforms. He's also leading to the banning and burning of many books, uh, the execution of scholars who don't see his way, and the great public works include the Great Wall of China, a national road system, and a road system also that has standardized the width of the axles of the vehicles that would travel on it. He also had a mausoleum built for himself with a life-size terracotta ceramic army. 6,000 warriors to protect the emperor, also are chariots, 40,000 real bronze weapons, and these were discovered in the late 20th century and have been one of the most remarkable archaeological finds of the 20th. I would say the discovery of King Tut's tomb in Egypt and then the discovery of the Terracotta Warriors are probably the most important finds in archaeology in the 20th century. Han Feizi is an English is an ancient Chinese text attributed to Han Fei. He's a Chinese philosopher who believes in the doctrine of legalism. So in the Qin Dynasty, uh, we have in the Qin Dynasty we have the um, uh, a idea of legalism where it assumes that people are naturally evil and always act to avoid punishment while simultaneously trying to achieve gains. Therefore, law must severely punish any unwanted action. So this is a kind of law that we will find also when we begin to study in the Enlightenment that we'll see from Thomas Hobbes and his Leviathan. Are people generally good or are people kind of naturally evil? This legalism believes the latter. The dynasty that, fo that follows the Qin dynasty is uh, the Han dynasty. The Han dynasty is considered to be kind of the more classical dynasty. Um, in the Han dynasty, we see a, a great art. Um, also, horses are brought in from Central Asia. These horses have a big body and shorter legs, and they are really good in warfare. And there is a lot of art and poetry made about the heavenly horses. In poetry, we are finding the classical style of poetry that has important aspects of Chinese poetry that include a direct voice of immediate experience, which provides a window into a person's soul. Architecture, silk, trading silk is making China wealthy uh, it, to the east and to Eastern Asia and to the west in Western Asia, and also paper is made for the first time in the Han Dynasty. And ultimately, the discovery of paper is going to lead to the end of parchment, which is made out of sheep, and papyrus, which is kind of fell out of favor when uh, uh, parchment was formed. And now from crushing wood pulp, we get paper originating in China. The Tang Dynasty is considered the golden age of Chinese arts and culture and power from 618 to 906. They have an inter international reputation and fully go into Buddhism, which crosses through much of Asia and into Japan. The transmission of Buddhism, one of the very important things that begins in India with 
a, um, a sage who uh, Guatana, uh, from um, Guatana, Guatanama, oh, why, his name is escaping me. Um, I'll, I'll get to it in, in a second here. Um, from Buddhism, which I'll be explaining when I show you a little bit of the next lecture, we have, again, this kind of coming to peace with the mind. And what we're finding in Buddhism is along the Silk Road and other trade areas, it's being spread. And also we're finding these caves and grottos that have a number of transmitters of Buddhas um, in bodhisattvas who are now taking on ethnic qualities, not of India, but of China. Um, painting in the Song Dynasty is kind of becoming perfected in terms of landscape painting. When we study landscape painting in the Romantic era, you're going to find that European landscape paintings have a landscape uh, a, a landscape format, so they would be horizontal rather than vertical. In Chinese painting, we find that the paintings are vertical. They are done with um, a lot of negative space, and you find kind of similar things in these paintings. Mountains, mists, running water, and a Buddhist monastery in the mountains. Very similar, but there are a number of different styles and ways that they are produced. In Japan, which had been inhabited since the Upper Paleolithic era, uh, we find, I think, a influence of China, but also its own thing is forming. And in the 12th century, political power is going to be held by a series of military dictators and enforced by a warrior nobility known as the samurai. In Japan, before Buddhism, there is a religion known as Shinto, an indigenous religion. This is a, a religion recorded in the Kojiki. And in the Kojiki, we find that this is a religion from the gods and a also a, a warrior religion as well. And there are still shrines today that hold their most sacred of their objects, including a sacred mirror. The Kojiki is the origin myth. It explores the exploits of the gods that lead to the lineage of the imperial family. We saw this in Egypt also, didn't we? Where Horus is the half-god, half-man that leads to the lineage of the pharaohs. Very smart idea. If you want to avoid revolution, make sure that people believe that your leader is part god. And I talk more about the Kojiki uh, in the slide. I hope you'll check it out. In the Heian period, around 1000 CE, we find Buddhism, uh, finally really taking hold in Japan. There had been earlier efforts, but it was considered a foreign religion, and then it was uh, kind of wiped off of Japan. And now here we're looking at the uh, Bayodin uh, um, temple, a wooden temple, the longest continual-use Buddhist temple in Japan. They replace the wood every few hundred years, has the distinctive curving sloping roofs, typically with ceramic tiles, bracket sets that keep the wood up on the ceiling up, and on the curved roofs, typically you see fish as kind of a prayer for the wood not to burn down. We find the iconography of Buddha, typically sitting cross-legged, Siddhartha Gautama is the original Buddha whose name uh, had briefly escaped me there. Um, now we are seeing a Japanese-style Buddha uh, sitting with silk roads, placid face, no emotion, cross-legged in a lotus leaf, and then a halo of fire. So Murasaki Shikubu, she is the first of the Japanese novelists, a poet and lady-in-waiting in the imperial court in the Heian period, and she is the author of the tale of Genji. So she begins a diary when she enters service in Shoshi's court and has long descriptive passages, some of which may have originated as letters, 
that cover her relationship with the other ladies in waiting. This is considered to be the first novel. Now, the first novel does not have a plot. It is simply events that happen and the characters grow older. Also, there are no names of the characters. It was considered rude to name names in the court. So the characters are described by either what they look or their rank or their clothing. And the tale ends abruptly in mid-sentence. It's divided into three parts, the first dealing with the life of Genji and the last dealing with the early years of two of Genji's descendants. By the uh, 12th century, in 1192, we have the shoguns who are now going to take over Japan and it is going to become a warrior society. The Kamakura period marks a transition from land-based economies to the concentration of military technologies and power in a specialized fighting class. Lords required loyal services from vassals, sounds familiar, who were rewarded with fiefs of their own. And this is more or less going to be what Japan looks like until it becomes modernized. The other kind of interesting lecture that I have here is titled Art for a Sacred World. I talk about Hinduism and also Buddhism. The couple of things I want to show before I end the lecture uh, are, the ca again, the caves. And we keep kind of coming back to these caves as sacred places and religious places. The Alora Caves aren't exactly caves. They are carved out of rock rather than being natural caves. So technically, I guess, yeah, they're a cave, but they're, they're carved out. And what you're looking at from the Alora Caves is a single rock that has carved these elaborate structures. We find caves that have barrel vaults carved into them, and of course, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas everywhere. The Magao Caves in China are um, caves, Buddhist caves, that the Getty in, uh, in Los Angeles are restoring and maintaining. And the caves, which are sometimes really elaborate, have been rebuilt. And I actually went to the Getty in Los Angeles and saw this particular cave built as an exact reproduction. One of the most important things found in the cave is cave number 17, the library cave. In this were a number of documents dating from 400 to 1000. And in this cave, an explorer came and bought some documents. And in this was found the Diamond Sutra. The Diamond Sutra is a Buddhist manual for converting. And it is the oldest dated printed manuscript printed through woodblock printing in May 11th, 868. This is 400 years before, I take that back, this is 700 years, 600 years, I guess, more accurately, my fault, 600 years before the printing press is invented in Germany and bookmaking begins uh, in printed form. So China is well ahead of the West in many, many ways. Okay. So that's all. I'm going to go over here today. Again, um, in the uh, auxiliary lectures, I just for the sake of time have not gone over it as in depth as I did uh, the first lecture, which is a continuum that is leading us into the Renaissance in the next few chapters. So for this assignment, watch the video. Really pay close attention to it. It really does a good job of explaining how Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism work together. And then I want you to think about the good life, eudaimonia that we had looked at in the Greek lecture, and the just life, the good life. And I want you to think about what makes a good life. What is the proper life? What do you feel is a proper, good, just life? And after studying this video, do Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism, do you think that following them might make a good, just life? So that's what I'd like you to write about in the discussion. 
Um, I will talk to you soon when we go over chapter six. Take care, everybody.